This interview is for information only and should not be considered as investment advice or a recommendation to buy shares in the company featured. Welcome to this stock box interview. Well, joining us today is Andrew Bell, the CEO of Red Rock Resources. Andrew, thank you for your time. How are you doing? Uh, I'm doing extremely well. Okay, good. Good to hear that. So let's catch up, um, as we usually do, on the recent update that's come up from the company. So we'll look at the DRC first. Of course, the arbitration, always good to get an update on how things are going with that. And the recent RNS saying there that you were told that you're about to receive an invitation to a concluding meeting. So, I mean, are we nearing the final throws here? Uh, yes, we, we were promised that last week. Whether it actually happens or happens on time is a different matter. Uh, and and we're also at the moment just having prepared for us, and I'm told is on its way, an invitation from the president's office to a meeting. Um, you know, we had someone who was talking about our case with the president directly uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago. Before that, we'd had various people talk to him, but tangentially, and not with a focus on it. So now this is being focused on. Um, President's given some advice on how to sort this, and we've been following that advice. And um, uh, we are doing other stuff which which maybe involves him. So I don't, you know, people think, ah, it's not going to happen, that sort of thing. But they don't realize that when we got this license in the first place, the reason why it was stolen from us and because it and, and you know, it was hundreds of millions were paid for it is because we got a very good asset that even in two or three months, people could see we'd got a very good asset because that was the time when we published our uh, or privately to our partners and people who we thought we could trust. We gave them a three-dimensional model of what we thought the deposit was based on the 96 historic holes that had been drilled. And that's what got everybody's cupidity up because they, before that, the local partners thought they'd done extremely well in a deal where they got $500,000 and it took, carried 20%. But when they started to see what it was really worth, they got greedy. And uh, that's why we had the problem. But if we could get a, an asset that good after 14 months of due diligence and effort, which we did, uh, why would people bet against us being able to get a solution uh, now? We, in fact, had one person who held us up, um, who was trying to make money for himself, a lawyer who became a minister and tried to use his ministerial position to favor his clients, but also telling them we can get red, we can run Red Rock right out of the country and then we can have 100% of the money and divvy it up and I get a million or two. Uh, but he's okay. gone. He's gone. Uh, we're back on where we ought to be. And by being polite, persistent, um, talking to people, um, not letting ourselves be put off, uh, you know, if if we're no good, if we're low caliber people, then we will gradually get edged out of the picture. If we are good people, as you might think we were because we got that license in the first place, then the people we deal with are not only good, but get better. And uh, we start to come to the attention of the authorities and be invited to participate in things with them and meet them. And uh, that's what's happening. Okay, so this this minister was using his position of power to to try and really yes look after himself. So Sadly, from... he tried he tried lots of things. For example, mm. he tried to get a, a judgment against us, not a judgment to overthrow our judgment for fifty point one percent because that was final and executory, but uh, an attempt to prevent us seizing the money or assets with what was called a surseance. Now, that's something that has gone out of legal language centuries ago. It remained as surcease in British poetic language. And, uh, you know, at the time of Shakespeare, a little longer, lasted a little bit longer in American English. Now it only exists, I think, in bankruptcy proceedings in the Netherlands, where it acts as a stay on a creditor's claim. <laughs> and because the judges knew they couldn't do it and it was all wrong, they resisted. So one of them he sent to somewhere from Lubumbashi, which is a nice place, he sent them somewhere where you have to go paddle up river and a boat for part mm. of the journey to get there. Another he sent to a war zone. Um, <clears throat> but all of this, these things have been overcome. They've been remedied. We come out on top because we have justice. And the fact is our, our 
paperwork was impeccable. So anytime it got in front of any tribunal or court, we won hands down. The other side had not only they lost, they had nothing, nothing. Everybody we deal with is either, a, in apart from being a lawyer or whatever, or a geologist, is either a pastor or the son of a pastor. So it is interesting that if you want to get good people who have a strong ethical sense, uh, these people, some people mock and say, ah, oh, you know, the pastors are stealing from everyone, and so on, and so on, because they're asking for money. No, I mean, you actually, most of these people are very Christian, uh, dedicated. They want to do the right thing. And it does make a difference when we, we started dealing only with these people who had a strong ethical framework. And this this final sort of invitation that you say is on the way, does that have to be hand-delivered or sent in the post? Or is it, you know... Well, well that invitation will come by... Uh, I suspect it will be hand delivered to our lawyers. Then we'll immediately be advised. That's the invitation to the arbitration. The okay. other invitation is a very, as a very personal one, um, from the president's private office, and um, that is being drafted. They, they want to talk to us about something uh, for the benefit, which is for the benefit of the Congo and for the future, and. Um, you know, obviously, we're not going to do anything there and unless and until we've got a settlement, which, is, which can be shown to the world as just. And any money we get from that settlement, we've got, we've repatriated home to show this can happen. We don't want a, a funny deal where we say, yes, we've got a settlement, but we immediately reinvest that money so we never actually see it. So it's just shuffling papers. No, I mean, this thing has got to be in the open, clear, uh, and everyone benefits from that. Okay, okay. So we can await that final invitation, that, that conc- the invitation to the concluding meeting, which in yeah. theory, that should be it then, effectively. Uh, yes. I don't think I have seen or heard of any draft, any uh, judgment or any judge having thought for even a moment that we didn't have right on our side. You know, uh, that is because we did legal due diligence, but most important of all, post-transaction, we kept absolutely solid records of, you know, we sent emails, we recorded emails, we put our position at every stage, anything happened. So we have uh, the post-transaction documentation to show that we didn't fail in any of our responsibilities or didn't give people an excuse and nobody was able to do anything <clears throat> you know, to dispossess us of our rights. Okay, okay, okay. Well, let's catch up on uh, Burkina Faso then. So again, from the update RNS, you talked about you having a diverse portfolio of gold interests with the potential, subject to all the usual caveats, to go into mines production. You talked about not giving up good gold ground. So just a a couple of questions that come off the back of this. I mean, how close are you to getting into production? You talk about subject to all the usual caveats, but it's distinctly lacking in there perhaps what the caveats might be. No, well, you know, uh, if I put, we're just about to come into production, then uh, inevitably something happens which causes sure. the leg to be completely um, outside our control. Now, I think what has made this take a little bit longer than we expected is that the uh, consultants we were dealing with who were going to help us with production, they wanted to do it on quite a large scale. And uh, so that meant bringing a lot of people uh, a lot of equipment from South Africa, a lot of people from India. Now, uh, where is the where is the delay that? Well, the license Raj in India may have disappeared a long time ago. They used to talk about, you remember, the Hindu growth rate because it was only about two to three percent because it was so sclerotic and bureaucratic. Well, uh, now it's much more of a free market economy and often grows faster than China, so it is it is growing, but. Much control exists. You need permits for an incredible number of things. And sending people to work overseas requires work, uh, uh, recruiting there to get people to work overseas requires a lot of permits. And because of some recent cases, Modi has put in a new layer of permissions. And each of these permissions is guarded by a gatekeeper who thinks he should receive a toll for passing that particular toll road. And I mean, uh, this is not something that sits easily with us. So we have to, so that causes some delay. We have to work very carefully within those constraints. So getting the people to um, Burkina to receive this equipment has been a difficulty. 
And our colleague who was bringing the equipment and the people is re reluctant to have his uh, equipment actually touch the ground without um, having his people who are experts from India there to receive it, check that it's not broken, check that nothing's been stolen, and provide continuing security. And we have been saying this is really not satisfactory for us. We cannot be in the hands of a distant bureaucracy whose timings we cannot control. So we've got a plan B in operation to do a quick start on a smaller scale, which in some ways is more satisfactory anyway, because if anything does hold you up, the unexpected, then you don't have um, you don't have high ongoing level of costs you have to cope with. I mean, I think we know, for example, you you are close to a company called Prem in Zimbabwe, and they were doing things on a fairly large scale or trying to, uh, but that meant that when delays came, things didn't work perfectly just at once. They had a level of costs that was difficult for them to cope with. Now, whether that was in the form of debt or all the other things it could be. This is a, a very frequent uh, problem with new projects. And so I'm very happy now that we've got a plan B, which now involves getting things onto the site extremely fast with people who are used to setting up camps, uh, who will be working <clears throat> on retainer for us full time. And uh, we'll, we'll at least get the setup right, the security right, and the small scale production. Uh, so that we'll make a little bit of money. And as soon as you've got those things right, it's easy to ramp up. Now, what hopefully then happens is everything is ready from India uh, to be fed into something already in existence. But I concluded that these guys uh, that we were dealing with from India, you know, they're very good at running something that's up, at fine-tuning it, so that you get the maximum possible recovery of free gold uh, and, uh, you know, the minimum possible shrinkage or, or other things going wrong. Uh, but that setting up a camp is a different thing. It's more like, you know, having Gantt charts and having uh, project management systems where each process feeds into another. And doing that in a slightly private company, back of the envelope way, by people who have done it for themselves in the past, but not in the context of a public company. I think we are now moving towards doing that very um, that very sensitive part, which is setting up uh, with people who are used to setting up uh, in in our way, speak our language on that, and then fine tuning, screwing everything down, getting the best possible return. That comes after, in a way, it's another stage. So it's horses for courses, and uh, we had to make the decision. But um, we do not want to see you know, further delays or to see our shareholders seeing further delays and perhaps losing confidence. So Good. once the Indians are ready to go there and do go there, then this equipment will be uh, landed and unloaded. But at the moment, it's it's on the way. And unless it moves, from, uh, unless it moves quite quickly, uh, it's going to have to be taken back to South Africa, released from bond, and VAT has to be paid, which will be a huge amount of money. So nobody wants that. So it is um, it is held in kind of in suspense at the moment. And uh, that's because we can't risk things being delivered and, and being stolen. But we, we also, uh, we don't want it arriving there and not to be ready to use it. Um, that would require a lot of personnel. So we start off, um, the way we're going to be doing. And that's over the next few days, uh, identifying equipment, getting it ready, then fly it in in one plane straight into operation. And what do you make of the comments from uh, Yuntra leader Ibrahim Tharore um, when he talked about um, withdrawing mining permits from some foreign uh, companies, saying that we know how to mine our own gold and I don't understand why we're going to let multinationals come and mine it. you have any sort of... Um, comments on that? Well, I, I do, actually, because um, our local Akib Burkinabe guy, who is uh, a geologist, but is very well uh, plugged in, knows what's happening, as mm -hmm. he uh, said it to me, uh, indeed, internationally, internationally, there's a lot of information circulating about the withdrawal of mining permits in Burkina. However, I can assure you that the Ministry of Mines had objective reasons, according to the mining code, to carry out these withdrawals. I'll show some examples. Uh, da, 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 da. 
As he says, to say that the government is reaching an agreement with the Chinese and the Russians to withdraw certain projects from the Europeans and other projects of Western companies is is fodder for political propaganda to harm the current regime. I assure you there are many Western mining companies that work in Burkina here without problem. So our view on this is it's noise. We have our own contacts with the government and indeed okay. have had uh, a direct contact with the president. And this is not the way it is. Um, but the more this these uh, occasional articles appear by sort of half-educated journalists and international Africanist, Africanist publications, uh, the better, because it prevents other people going in there and picking up what may be some very good opportunities for us. So let's just finish off by talking about uh, New Ballarat Gold. Of course, the situation there with needing to make a payment, I think, to keep that license going, and you're proposing to... Um... Uh, we need to make a payment to the vendor, yeah. um, and that, that, will be, that will be duly made. What we have been trying to do uh, I would say recently, and we'll continue trying to do, uh, is to find uh, a vehicle through which we could list this in Australia. We're on it. We have a number of different islands in the far. And, uh, well, it's the summer coming up, so as soon as we've dealt with the immediate issue, uh, I think with with Congo and also with Burkina, uh, I'll be heading out there and sit on top of it till we get a resolution. Right. Okay. Good stuff. Well, thank you very much, Andrew, for all of that update. So in terms of short term things to come, really that concluding meeting with the DRC, um, getting activity started on the ground in that quick, um, more swift yeah. manner that you talked it, about with quick, Burkina. Quick start, quick start in Burkina or bush start, whatever, but we're going to be producing gold and we're going to be producing it at a uh, low cost. And that is going to be uh, quite quick, as we said. Okay. In the well, I look forward to seeing the announcement when you have indeed got that production going. But for now, thank you very much for your time. Andrew Bell, the CEO of Red Rock Resources. Thank you. If you enjoyed this interview, then give us a thumbs up, a like or a retweet. Subscribe to us on YouTube or follow us on Twitter and hit that notification bell to be the first to know when we release new content. There's loads of great content on our website too, across all our programmes at stockboxmedia.com. Thank you for watching.